The Conspiracy of One by Edward H. Hurlbut. Kinda caught you fellows off base, Nori. Bradley, a star man for the Herald, drawled it at me invidiously as I entered the police reporter's room at the Hall of Justice. Merriman of the Times and a half dozen morning paper men, their copy turned in, had drifted down to the room to await any late developments. The Ratto story had been on for three days, and the Herald and the Times had put over the arrest of Bernardo Toski, camerist, at the expense of Lanigan and myself. "'Better shoot a few absinthe drops into Lanigan,' continued Bradley, "'and then maybe you'll land something. "'He's been sober so long he's lost his grip.' Bradley had fared hardly at the expense of Lanigan on more than one occasion. I was about to fling it back at him when Lanigan's voice interrupted me. He had entered the room, unfortunately, just in time to hear Bradley's words. Uh, "'Possibly,' he said." There was an embarrassed pause. Lanigan had a caustic tip to his tongue, and they awaited it now. He studied Bradley without expression, leaning against the door sill. But, curiously enough, there was no outburst. It was always difficult to foresay just what form Lanigan's humor would take. "'Charlie,' he said at last to Bradley, and there shaded into his voice a subtle coloring of unconscious pathos, "'what have I ever done to you?' I have never done you dirt, nor any man in the business dirt. I have played the game square. Why is it that I am always singled out like that? Have I ever betrayed my paper or my friends? Have I ever brought dishonor to the name of the newspaperman? If I have drunk, it has been out of public sight. I have fought hard, Charlie, fought hard to break the habit. It belongs to a past day in our game." and irrespective of that I may wish to be remembered around here some day as something other than drunken Jack Lanigan. I can't help it if I have a knack of landing stories. I've got to play the game right with my paper, haven't I? And here in this reporter's room of all places I thought for a little lift and a hand along, and you are trying to shove me down. His voice hardened in bitterness. I've played a lone hand all my life, though, Charlie. It seems to be in the cards that I keep it up. My eyes blurred, because I alone knew how hard he had fought that battle. Beneath his cynical exterior, he had a soul as sensitive to slights as a girl. Boyishly, I made a lunge at Bradley, but Lanigan, with a swift move, had my arm in that lean, powerful hand of his. "'It don't go,' he said softly. "'We are full-grown men.' There was an awkward pause, then Merriman, of few words, said sententiously, "'It's your move, Charlie.' and Bradley put out his hand, which Lanigan took. Jack, said the herald man, I'm a cad. There isn't a writer man in the game than you. Forget it, then, said Lanigan. I have. But as we left the reporter's room together, I noticed that the whiteness that had come over Lanigan's face remained there. Don't let it worry you, Jack, I said anxiously. Don't you bother, laddie. He did me more good than liquor, and I never felt the dragging for the stuff worse than tonight. I'm going into this story now for fair, and I'm going in to smash the Times and the Herald flatter than a matrix. The Ratto case was one that occupied considerable public attention several years ago, interest arising in the first instance through the peculiar manner in which the crime was disclosed. Ratto, a wealthy Italian commission merchant, had disappeared, no great commotion being raised for the first few days. The police made the customary desultory search, uh, the search consisting mainly of the name and description of Ratto being read out at the watches in the various station houses. The mystery in the disappearance might have remained unsolved for weeks had it not been for a lineman, Waters, who, perched on the cross-tree of a telegraph pole, commanding a view of the windows of a room in the vacant house where Ratto's dead body lay, made the discovery. No policeman being in the vicinity, Waters, with residents of the vicinity, entered the house. There had followed much newspaper speculation and police deduction. The Mafia and the Camorra came in for attention, the latter organization being one that was at that time 
long before the viterbo trials just coming to the attention of the american regular police and the secret service as counterfeiting of american currency formed one of the camorra accomplishments the peculiar interest in the manner in which the ratto killing was discovered was this three months previously a crime had been discovered under almost identical circumstances by the same lineman waters in that case rosendorn a jewish tailor was found after a several days disappearance by waters at work on the lines who happened to see the body as he glanced through the window of a vacant house from his elevated perch following the discovery of the body by waters the case had been speedily cleared up by the police and proved to be an affair arising from conjugal jealousy waters was a man well advanced in years the strain of the appearance at the coroner's jury and the preliminary hearings in the police court appeared slightly to unbalance his mind the spectacle of the murdered man that he beheld through the windows of the vacant house was constantly before him he was a man who had gone through a placid life and never figured in any scene of shocking violence or of murder after the disposal of the rosendorn case waters became possessed of a mania for climbing telegraph poles commanding the windows of vacant houses here and there and everywhere about the city he might be seen spiking himself up a pole peering intently and scuttling down he was a familiar figure to all policemen and many citizens he made a practice of haunting police headquarters and his imagination beginning evidently to visualize the first scene once or twice led futile parties into vacant houses with the declaration that he had discovered a body the police reporters humored him and he came to know the most of them particularly lanagan who found waters case was of profound interest several stories were written about him and his self-appointed cross-beam task of discovering murdered people in vacant houses and then he made good weeks of poking and prying and shining up and down telegraph poles brought their reward and waters discovered another crime that of ratto he had been slain with an ordinary blackjack which was found by the body during the three days of excitement following the discovery of the commission merchant's body waters thrived upon the publicity that he received he carried bundles of papers containing accounts of his find and with his picture taken in many ways climbing up telegraph poles peering into a window from a cross tree a cameraman nearly lost his life slipping on a crossbeam taking this picture and as he looked ten years ago his last gallery picture unearthed exclusively by a proud cub reporter he was as tickled as a boy and it was confidently predicted around police headquarters that he would find an end in an insane asylum from pure joy in a month but the ratto case did not clear up quite as easily as had the rosendorn case it will be recalled in san francisco that a swift night ride in the police launch to black diamond had resulted in the arrest of bernardo toski claimed by the police to be the leader of the camorra in the west a police theory of attempted blackmail by that organization seemed to have been well bolstered up the local ramifications of the camorra were proved beyond all doubt mysterious persons suspected of being camorra agents who had been talking to ratto shortly before his disappearance were being diligently sought the fear of the camorra by the residents of the latin quarter seriously hindered the police and newspaper men in their work even the native-speaking italian detail of upper policemen making little progress against the terror that the shadow of the camorra threw upon the quarter police and newspaper judgment were slowly settling that ratto's death was due to one of those far-reaching conspiracies of the camorra chieftain and his minions such was the situation at midnight when lanagan and i dropped out of the reporter's room the arrest of toski that we had been scooped on had been made shortly after midnight the night before a sullen hunch on lanagan's part that the crime was in no way reminiscent of the methods of the camorra as he understood those methods from a mass of inquiry and first-hand reading had led us away from the police headquarters just a few moments before toski had been slipped up the back elevator and placed in detinue 
the man regularly assigned to the night police detail at the hall of justice a new man on the beat had missed the arrest working against seasoned men on the times and the herald with their inside sources of prison information however we were supposed to be doing the heavy work on the story so the burden of the trimming fell upon us lanagan was morose he had nothing more to say as we walked down kearney street and turned up broadway i thought he was going to caesar's the original caesar's with the two tables and the marvellous cuisine that pioneered the way for the glaring cafe chantant of to-day's slumming parties but he walked rapidly past caesar's and on to turn in at bressy's a short distance up the slope of telegraph hill it was a dirty little place one of the corner wine joints sprinkled thickly in out of the way pockets of the congested latin quarter at bressy's in addition to the bar there was a little eating place at the rear separated from the bar by dingy curtains one room further back held a piano where on occasion one might hear his ash man or the flower vendor from third and market streets or a waiter off duty from the downtown cafes volume forth the prologue or swing faultlessly through the toreador song just got a tip that they were trying to hook mine host bressy into the thing as a camorra leader was all that lanagan said we sat at one of the tables while Lanigan pulled the faded curtains almost together. Madame Bressy, she of the famed sauté mêlée, was indisposed, so the daughter, Bina, would serve us if agreeable. Perfectly so, said Lanigan, rather with a note of satisfaction, it struck me, though when I glanced at his face in some surprise, for he was a man who was ordinarily unmoved of women, it was expressionless. Bresci went on to his bar after giving orders in the kitchen, and we sat there some time in silence, long enough for Lanigan to send the nicotine of three evil manillas to his lungs. I saw that his eyes never left the opening through the curtains. Then his cigar, from his mouth for the moment, was suspended in air on its travel back, and I followed his sharp glance through the curtain. Dinoli and Alberta, two plainclothes men, detailed in the Latin Quarter, had entered the saloon. Instantly the babble from the voices of many volatile Italians ceased. The saloon on the moment became quiet, save for the rattling of glasses and one click of the old-fashioned maplewood cash register. The detectives passed the time with Bresci, casually sized up the gathering, missed Lanigan and myself, and left. Instantly there broke forth a riot of sputtering Italian. The word ratto we heard, and then, obviously, at some motion toward our curtain from Bresci, the babble stopped as suddenly as it began, and within five moments the throng had idled out and the saloon was still. Bresci, demanded Lanigan suddenly, what were they saying out there about ratto? Were they camerists? Bresci's hand went straight over his head. Corpo de Cristo, no, no, he exclaimed, paling. Oh, never speak such word here, no. They say too bad Ratto be killed. He mopped his brow of its perspiration, suddenly started, and glanced furtively through the curtains to see whether anyone had come in and heard the conversation. I think you're a liar, Bresci, said Lanigan pleasantly, but as I can't talk Italian, I can't prove it. It's pretty funny how that powwow shut up the minute those coppers blew through that door. But you better wipe your steaming brow again and beat it back to the bar. You've got a customer. Who is? Lanigan whispered to me as Bresci left. No other than Lawrence Morton of the Secret Service, just assigned here from Seattle. Then he continued, I met him the other day on that counterfeiting story at the beach. Just a shade curious, I should say, the attention Bresci is attracting tonight from the big and the little hawkshaws. It bears out my tip. Morton had a drink or two, complained of being tired, and drifted casually over to the curtains, opened them, saw us, and was backing easily away when Lanigan called out from the darkness. He had turned off the incandescent earlier. Come in, Morton. Nothing to get exclusive over, switching on the light. Morton dropped into a chair. If he was perturbed at being made, he did not show it. He was generally reputed one of the two or three cleverest operators in the government service. That was good work you did on Iowa Slim, from all I hear, he vouchsafed. There's a better coming up, replied Lanigan indifferently. 
"'What brings you to Brescia's?' Morton shrugged his shoulders. "'You know the two rules of our department?' "'Guard the president and turn up counterfeiters,' said Lanigan. "'Well, Lanigan, you've got the cachet to me from a good friend. "'The secret service man loses his job who talks, "'but I don't mind taking a chance with you "'and telling you in confidence that in this particular case "'I'm not guarding the president, "'being as he is, as you know, in Washington. I "'Haven't been sampling any uh, salami?' drawled Lanigan. "'Morton laughed. "'You sure are a clever one at that. "'No, I haven't come across any that suited my palate. "'I'm particular.' We had a café royale, with Lanigan pouring his thimble full of cognac in my glass, and Morton left. The Camorra, it develops, said Lanigan, have been shipping to this country from blank, excellent counterfeit American banknotes. They ship them in salami sausages. Maybe, if one has gone astray, we will get a slice of banknote with our salami and sauté, for here it comes on a tray with the fair Bina serving." Bina, Bressi's daughter, was an Italian of absolute beauty, one of those glowing faces and perfect forms you see in the old Italian masters. I noticed in a moment that the comely Bina had much attention to show Lanigan. We finished our meal, and Lanigan led the way to the inner room where the piano was located. I had heard him at different times sputter out rag, but when Nevin's A Day in Venice suite came breathing softly beneath his fingertips from out of that wrangly piano, I could but listen in amazement. Man of mysterious beginnings, he had dropped into the San Francisco newspaper game overnight, been given his tryout by the Brotherhood, found to speak the language of the tribe, and had thereafter been unconditionally accepted. Such a mess as the Bradley affair only served to emphasize his leadership. With the last fine chord of the Buona Notte, there was a stillness broken only by the instant and ecstatic hand-clapping of Bina. If I ever saw the thing called love shine forth from the human eye, it suddenly illuminated those dusky eyes that moment. "'Oh, Madonna, Madonna!' cried softly. "'Encore, encore!' Lanigan zipped through a lustspiel to drop back then to the last composition. It was truly remarkable, the manner in which he brought the encroaching blindness of the great Beethoven sobbing out of the misery of the minor bass. "'Did a lot of that sort of thing when I was younger,' he said apologetically, before the wanderlust hit me. He was through. Benna fluttered about him, and Lanigan's head was close to hers. She was a full-sexed creature, but young, and I balked. I spoke to Lanigan sharply after a moment or two, and we departed. She gave him a shy little glance as he left. He laughed. "'What a covenanter you are! A psalm-singer gone wrong for fair!' "'I don't like it,' I said stubbornly, but with the best of intentions. "'She's only a child.' I didn't yet know all the sides of this man Lanigan. He whirled on me, and I got a swift sense of the power that could flash from those dark eyes, and I felt, with the intimacy of personal experience, how effective they must be when working upon a guilty mind. "'Let me tell you, Howard,' he bit out, using my given name for the first time in our friendship, Nori being his ordinary salutation, "'that I'm working on the Ratto story. Get me?' What do you take me for, anyhow? I've stood one whelp for my own kind tonight, and I don't want another. Lanigan received his second apology of the night, but he didn't appear to want it at that. His uncanny faculty of reading men's minds seemed to tell him that my remark was in good faith. Ah, forget it, he laughed. But just for that, Nori, I'll keep to myself for the present the interesting bit of information that Binna gave me. For Brecci is a Camorra agent, after all, and Binna, who is all eyes and ears, knows precisely the truth about Ratto's death, in so far as it pertains to the Camorra. I guess that will hold you for a while. But what a lover of music she is! Let's call it a day. Don't look for me tomorrow. I'm off on a little lay of my own. Keep in general reach of a telephone so I can get you in a hurry and give that slave driver of a Samson my distinguished compliments and tell him I will show up when it pleases me to get damned good and ready. I hammered away at the routine of the story the next day. I was just a plain plodder, ordinarily dependable, but never particularly brilliant, and neither saw Lanigan nor heard from him. 
a lively angle was given to the story when dinola and alberti discovered concealed in one of ratto's game refrigerators six choice salami sausages that his death had evidently prevented him disposing of in the proper way for neatly rolled in a half-inch wad in the dead centre of each was a roll of ten one hundred dollar gold bills of u s currency the secret service men apprised raged at the information being given to the press claiming that they had been working to round up the entire gang for months and that the publication would serve as warning to the others but leslie more concerned with solving the ratto mystery and hanging it on tosky than with handling uncle sam's minor details and being also a great believer in the assistance intelligent newspaper publicity could be to the police gave the facts out the facts would appear to link ratto indubitably with the camorra ring engaged in the importation of counterfeit currency and obviously eliminated the camorra blackmail theory with respect to his death with ratto now definitely established as a leader of the slippery camorra it was a hard organization to get definite proof on the police were thrown back on a theory of a fight between camorra leaders possibly over some division of the profits or some breach of faith the camorra history shows that it was not nor is not slow to take vengeance even on its own people lanagan was missing the next day again and i was surprised in view of the sensational developments i was following the police lead and it all pointed to the camorra to me nor did he appear for work the third day nor give me word of himself and on this day the police had an admission from tosky that he had visited ratto on the evening of his disappearance it may be well to say here too that the secret service men although working at cross purposes with the regular police had been putting the screws to tosky and morton had finally gotten enough information to supplement his own investigations and in a swift swoop five members of the tosky gang were in the federal cells at the oakland jail charged with handling counterfeit money all in all the situation was growing highly complex for a routine plodder and still no lanagan i had just about made up my mind to go on a still hunt for him confident that he must have broken his vows of abstinence when he called me up his message was curt suggest to sampson to stick personally until he hears from me meet me at once at hyde and lombard sampson usually left the office at midnight lanagan preferred his dynamic energy on the desk when a big smash was on and when he asked for sampson personally i knew he had landed and sampson always preferred being at the city desk when lanagan was swinging home on the bit fine work was all sampson said it was not in his cold-blooded cosmos to show disinterested enthusiasm possibly it was that characteristic coupled with twenty years seasoning at the wheel that made him the greatest city editor in the west lanagan's clothes had that peculiarly hand-dog appearance that the newest suit will get when a man has slept in it once or twice and lanagan's clothes were seldom new so the appearance was emphasized he had evidently found no time either to shave or change his collar worn lines were about his mouth and eyes such as you see in athletes who have pulled off weight in hard training but his eyes those dark mesmeric eyes were sparkling and the old engaging trick of smiling was there began to think maybe i'd lost my grip he said with a short laugh but i have either turned up one of the finest police stories in my time or i've gone plumb crazy we will soon know without more words he walked quickly several blocks down over the eastern slope of the hill and turned into a narrow tradesman's alley i noticed that he was watching keenly before and after us he slipped through a gate in a high board fence and we were in a yard overgrown with shrubbery and weeds the house was a corner one and of that familiar type of old family residence seen in most localities that has gone to seed on a mortgage it was vacant he opened the kitchen door with a skeleton key, and we walked upstairs, turning into a large room, commanding a view of the street. He kept away from the window, I noticed. "'Draw up the Morris chair,' he said facetiously, as he squatted on his legs. I sat down against the wall and pulled out a cigar, but he stopped me. 
can't take a chance smell of smoke might give the whole thing away see anything curious about this room i looked at the bareness of it and shook my head examine it he said you haven't even looked it over i knew he was not given to joking so i got up and went over the room carefully the door to the hall was swung back against the wall and i closed it hanging on the doorknob by the leather wrist throng was a blackjack a duplicate of the one with which ratto was slain lanagan was laughing quietly what are your sensations at being in a prospective death chamber he asked visions of being suddenly pocketed in that vast out-of-the-way mansion by a ring of camorists assailed me and i instinctively felt for my revolver don't worry said the baffling lanagan the trap won't spring for several hours yet but after it does spring he went on and this mess is over i'm prepared to present the fair Bina with the biggest box of french mixed in town that is quizzically if my puritanical mentor will permit me to but seriously norrie his next words came forth rather hurriedly and much as a shamed schoolboy might make a confession seriously these italian girls are mature women at sixteen and though you may not think it i am only thirty-four when it filtered into me what he was driving at i jumped to my feet and pulled him to his jack i cried delightedly you don't mean no he said shortly i don't mean anything now or any other time norrie until i've taken a seat on this water wagon that i know i can ride for life my thoughts shot back to that declaration in the reporter's room that i had pondered often since uttered it was clear enough now he was a man's man jack lanagan and looking back now even after the years that have passed since then looking back from the content of my own cozy home the tears spring and i stop writing he did not marry bina that's about enough of that he said i wanted you to get the lay of the house by daylight let's get out of here i've got to see leslie but we were only as far as the head of the stairs leading to the lower floor when a key grated in a lock some place beneath us and lanagan gripped my arm his fingers to his lips his eyes glittering like a snake's we swung back on tiptoes to a small closet at the end of the hall pulling the door almost shut after us lanagan dropped his eye to the keyhole he had drawn his revolver and i drew mine my heart was beginning to thump like a big bass drum there came to my ears the sound of footfalls up the creaking stairs at first it seemed like a dozen men and i concluded for once that one of lanagan's traps was going to spring the wrong way the footfalls disintegrated as they came nearer and i found there was but one person lanagan's eye might have been stuck fast to that keyhole for his hat brim did not waver the fraction of an inch as he held his rigid cramped position for long minute after minute finally the footfalls sounded back down the stairs lanagan did not move until to our taut eardrums came the sound of the closing rear door well i asked him wiping the perspiration from my forehead all he said was fine fine wait a bit yet norrie that was merely a scout taking a last look to be sure that blackjack hadn't been removed by any prospective tenants who might have been here he glanced at his dollar watch it was six o'clock there'll be two good hours before darkness he said we'll take a chance and leave the house uncovered while i get hold of the chief unless you want to stay here he asked banteringly i did not want to stay there but he had me squarely in the door as it were and i had to say i would if he wanted it i sometimes think many a man is made a hero against his will then a great shaft of illumination struck me and i asked here jack why should they bring that black jack here they could bring a dozen with them and nobody be any the wiser but all the satisfaction i got out of that inscrutable irritating man was how bright the understudy is becoming you'll be tackling high sea yourself next however he went on i'm not going to permit you to remain here firstly and mainly because i am confident nothing will happen until after dark although for a moment i thought my theory had gone wrong and in the second place because you might scramble the whole platter on me and get to shooting recklessly we slipped out of the alley after lanagan had reconnoitred long 
he had good reason for not wishing to appear at police headquarters it was generally known that he was off on some sort of a still hunt he had been seen occasionally by some of the boys and it was known too that he was not drinking his appearance at headquarters in conference with leslie therefore might bring a corps of sharp-eyed newspaper men on our trail he got leslie on the wire and within thirty minutes was in deep conversation with that astute thief-taker in the rear room at allenburg's there were few sections of the city where lanagan was not on intimate terms with saloon men there are many times when they can be valuable to the police reporter particularly in the tenderloin and downtown the two did not take me into their confidence but once i heard leslie say explosively jack you're as daffy as a horny toad i caught only part of lanagan's answer he was talking earnestly i tell you chief my information is correct i've got the only leak in san francisco into the camorra and neither you nor the secret service have a man who can tap it it's worth a chance i tell you we'll want brady wilson and maloney we've got to cover every point take no chances of a murder getting by on us and smash this thing right on the nose leslie studied lanagan long and carefully he had never been wrong yet not drinking jack he asked at last not a smell in three months said lanagan you're on the chief finally said decisively i grew restive at not being taken in but lanagan said i was becoming so very bright that a little discipline would do me good hearkening back i suppose to that remark about the blackjack i said no more they outlined their plan maloney was to hide in the yard of the house directly across from the alley gate in that old-fashioned neighborhood tight board fences and hedgerows are common and wilson across the street where he could command the window to the room where the black jack hung we three with brady were to take our position inside the house the moment anybody entered the alley gate or by the front door lanagan considered it likely that that approach might be taken under cover of darkness maloney was to lift himself to the fence top and strike a match wilson in turn as though lighting a cigar would strike a match and one or the other of us watching back from the room window of the house would know that the trap was set in addition to watching for maloney's signal wilson's position enabled him easily to cover the front door lanagan it appeared had planned the coup hours before and had his coverts already selected their vigil ended on the outside maloney and wilson were then to jump and cover the front and rear doors respectively in case of any miscue inside that might permit of an escape miss q was lanagan's word and i reflected with some apprehension that any miss q with such nervy officers as leslie and brady that would permit an escape out of that house would mean that probably all of us would be candidates for morgue slabs dusk found us all drifting one by one to our stations when i finally entered through the alley door i could see neither maloney nor wilson and yet i knew they had both gone before me and were in position i was the last one in and lanagan was waiting there to lock the kitchen door after me we trooped silently upstairs shoes off and in hand it was an unreal situation waiting there as the deeper blackness of night settled down and the night sounds of an empty house assailed us magnified brady was standing the watch at the window for the signal the rest of us were lined up in the broad hall it was so dark you couldn't see a man a foot in front of you hours it seemed to me must have passed with no conversation save a scattered whisper or so we had tried the hall and room floors and the door to the hall closet and they gave out no squeaks Psst. softly sibilantly came brady's signal we backed into the closet brady in a second was with us the door was opened six inches with lanagan and leslie ready for a spring i was in some fashion away back in the rear of the closet a key grated in the kitchen lock and it sounded through the vast empty house with a peculiarly sinister harshness it was a situation certainly unique in crime the stairs creaked there was the sound of heavy labored breathing but there was but one set of footfalls we heard the door open to the room where the ugly blackjack hung 
and as it did leslie swung our door out and silently as so many black ghosts we moved to the other door against the window we could see a man's form dimly outlined and then there was a flash of blinding brilliance a report that crashed in the empty stillness of the abandoned mansion with the reverberation of a twelve-pound gun and under the arcs of the swiftly flashing pocket lights of brady and leslie we beheld stretched almost at our feet as the form toppled backward and stiffened out waters there was a gushing wound in the temple death had been instantaneous with an eagerness that was more animal than human lanagan tore back water's coat ran his hand swiftly through his every pocket and finally with a ha of satisfaction like a snarl pulled out from an unsealed envelope in an inside pocket a page of writing daffy chief daffy is a horned toad well here's the proof written in the hand and phraseology of a fairly intelligent man it was as follows i killed ratto i guess i have been crazy i went crazy looking for murdered people in vacant houses from telegraph poles i couldn't find any more and then i thought i would kill somebody i told ratto on the street that i had seen a man's body in that house and he went in with me i'd never seen him before i had left the door open as i ran out to him but he didn't suspect anything i killed him with a blackjack and then found the body in three days from the telegraph pole i had picked out the place several days ahead i got everything ready and came up several times and it was funny no one saw me i thought ratto would get the police but he was nervy all right and jumped right in after me the room in this house i discovered in the same way it was even better than the flat where ratto was killed because the neighborhood didn't have so many people the blackjack is on the doorknob i put it there so as i went into the room first to light a match i could take it off the inside doorknob and hit my man as he followed me in that reporter lanagan and another man were hanging around this neighborhood today. he has been talking to me kind of suspicious lately and i guess the jig is up it's funny the police never suspected me i guess i have been crazy all right i would hang anyhow but i am all right now and i will kill myself in the room it's all the return i can make for ratto if nobody hears the shot i hope somebody finds me from a telegraph pole it will give the newspapers lots to write about that's what made me crazy i got too much fame i guess william waters there was a prolonged pause then hump growled leslie savagely the fame you got isn't a marker to the fame that reporter lanagan has heaped on me for the original ass i'm it i took that fellow for a loon jack shake lanagan could not forbear a soft sarcasm that uh, daffy as a horned toad rankled give your men a little class in kraft ebbing lombroso nordau or some of those specialists and you will get a better understanding of the pulling power of crime he said dryly i hadn't figured quite this kind of a finish he went on but the minute he blazed that shot into his brain i was sure he had left a confession if he couldn't get notoriety in life he would in death quickly lanagan told of his suspicion settling on waters after bina his leak to the camorra had told him that the death of ratto was as much of a mystery to the camorras as it was to the police with bresci a camorra leader the wise-eyed and wise-eared little bina heard and saw much that lanagan in turn was told on her say so he had absolutely dismissed the camorra he set himself to watch waters and for three days and nights scarcely ever let the lineman out of his sight from safe vantage points he had watched waters at his grisly work of climbing innumerable telegraph poles at times he had casually picked him up and talked with him it was evident that he had also aroused waters suspicions he noticed him lingering in the neighborhood of the house where we now were and finally sneak in by the alley door after he left the house lanagan had hunted up a locksmith secured a set of skeleton keys himself and let himself into the house not knowing exactly what to expect he found the blackjack on the doorknob saw the telegraph pole out of the window and in a flash had realized the entire plan of the crazed lineman 
Lanagan assumed that Waters would not attempt to lure his victim in daylight. He had come back to the house while we were there, merely moved by some insane morbidity to visit again the scene selected for the crime, picture possibly the slain man on the floor, himself peering in from the telegraph pole, and then the columns of newspaper space. That the room was commanded by a telegraph pole I had not noticed during the day, or even my sluggish wits might have given me a hint of the truth. The shot seems to have raised no stir outside, chief, said Lanigan briskly, when the recital was done. Call in Wilson and Maloney and stick around and give us two hours leeway before you get the morgue. It's 12.30. Now, son, you hit the pipe with me for the Inquirer. End of The Conspiracy of One <laughs>